Hello, my name is Rosalind Gill and I'm Professor of Social and Cultural Analysis at City University, part of the University of London. I've been researching gender in the media for 30 years now, looking at journalism and at the creative and media industries more generally. In this module, we're going to look at gender in the newsroom. We'll start by looking at ways of documenting and measuring gender in the newsroom, exploring a number of different indices that can be used to assess this. As we go through the unit, we'll talk about why inequalities still persist, even though women are entering media professions in greater numbers than men and are equally, if not better, qualified. We'll talk about gendered experiences in and outside the newsroom, and we'll look at how things are changing and which new initiatives are making a difference. Historically, journalism has been a very male-dominated profession, and in many parts of the world this is still the case. The Global Media Monitoring Project, which was introduced in an earlier module, reported in the most recent study in 2015 that female journalists were underrepresented in all topic areas except for science and health. This underrepresentation of women reporting and presenting news is even more striking when we look at much more senior roles, such as correspondent or editor. Indeed, when a woman takes the helm in a high-profile media company, this often becomes a news story in itself. When Jill Abramson became the first woman editor at the New York Times in 2011, she broke a run of 160 years of male editors. Likewise, Catherine Viner's rise to editorship of The Guardian represented the first time in the organisation's nearly 200-year history that the paper had been edited by a woman. The trend is not limited to newspapers, but can be seen across the media world, from the BBC, which has never had a female director general, to the newer digital media giants like Facebook, Google and Apple. In fact, a 2018 study of the top 100 media companies found only six women chief executives. Women have been writers as long as men have, despite the difficulties and challenges involved, such as having to write under a male pseudonym to get published. For at least the last 150 years, women have worked as journalists, whether in magazines, on radio, or in highly visible roles as war reporters. Since the 1980s, the profession has expanded and more and more women are entering it. In some parts of the world, journalism training courses enrol more women than men. In Australia, trainee journalists are 85% female. Some scholars have worried that journalism is becoming a so-called pink-collar occupation and, in the process, following the sociological law that the more women enter a profession, the lower its status becomes. This remains a matter of debate. However, what is clear is that while women and men start their careers on equal footing, at least in formal terms, patterns of inequality all too often develop. Newsrooms are marked by both horizontal and vertical segregation along gender lines. Horizontal segregation refers to segmentation across the profession or industry, the tendency for women to be found in the less prestigious parts such as local newspapers or local radio, or siloed into particular areas of journalism, such as lifestyle or food and diet. Vertical segregation captures the hierarchical organisation of journalism and can be thought of as a pyramid structure in which the higher up one looks, the fewer women there are. The Women's Media Foundation collected data from more than 500 companies in 59 nations and found that women journalists were most likely to be found in routine administrative and news gathering roles and least likely to be in decision making or policy making roles. In senior editorial roles, men dramatically outnumber women and depressingly, this holds true even in the new digital media operations. Despite legislation that's designed to ensure equal pay for equal work, there are also still dramatic inequalities in what women and men are paid. In 2017, more than 40 senior women at the BBC, including journalists, wrote to the Director General calling on him to act now and tackle the gender pay gap. The letter read, the pay details released in the annual report showed what many of us suspected for many years, that women at the BBC are paid less than men even for the same work.
In 2018, Carrie Gracie, one of the most senior and experienced journalists at the BBC, resigned from her role as China editor in protest, having learned that her male counterparts were earning at least 50% more than her. As part of her fight for equal pay, Gracie wrote an open letter to the British public to speak out about what she called the crisis of trust at the BBC and its secretive and illegal pay culture. Let's hear from Carrie Gracie. So the point at which I wrote that open letter and published it was in a way halfway through my fight over pay. I, like many other women, had been really shocked when we saw the high pay disclosures that the BBC was forced to make by the government in the summer of 2017. And at that point, I, like others, discovered that I was being paid less than men doing the same job. So in my case, that was less than men who were North America editor and Middle East editor. And I, uh, as China editor, and another woman, who was Europe editor at the time, were being paid a lot less. I mean, we couldn't tell exactly how much, because at that point the high pay was published in bands of £50,000, so that's obviously quite wide band. But the North America was earning between £220,000 to £250,000, and I was earning £135,000. And I had gone to China insisting that I, as a senior woman reporter, must be paid on a par, equal pay, with men doing the same job. So it's like, what? How did that happen? You know, three and a half years later, I find that I'm earning possibly not much over half what the men are doing for, for, for the similar roles. So we had been BBC women, but which became a kind of informal but quite large group of women in the end. We had been trying to talk to our management about how to sort this out. Um, I didn't want more money personally because you know it's a public service broadcaster I was well paid I work with teams who uh, are very dedicated very talented and work incredibly hard who earn a lot less than me so I personally didn't think that um, paying women at the top end of the pay spectrum more was the way to deal with the problem I I felt that the BBC needed another solution, but I definitely needed to be paid equally. I wasn't prepared to collude in a discriminatory pay culture. So we'd argued about this internally with management for a long period, um, and we weren't really getting anywhere. Anyway, you know, I was offered a pay rise of four to five thousand pounds, but that wasn't equality. It didn't deal with the issues. It didn't deal with the bigger systemic issues, which I was concerned about. So um, that's why I published the open letter. So that then turned into a bit of a news for all and a bit of a fight between me and management, which was now public. Um, and then the fight went on. And as many people will know, you know, employers have to have an internal complaints process. So I was in the middle of the internal complaints process. It went on for several more months. It came to an end. It didn't resolve the issue. And then it was like me eyeballing the BBC's director general to actually find a way of solving the problem. And that was really me threatening to go to employment tribunal and saying, you know, we've just got to sort this out. I'm not prepared to be found less than equal except by a robust process. I didn't feel the internal process was robust enough. So it was going to have to be at enormous expense, cost of enormous time, potentially, you know, aspects of my career in order to kind of get this solved. And at that point, the director general um, decided to do the other thing, to override the internal process and to make me equal. So I then won a large payout, which I gave to charity, the Fawcett Society, which is one of the you know, most important gender equality societies, charities in the UK, uh, in order to do two things, one of which was to help provide legal support for women in low paid work who weren't part of unions and therefore had no legal support to draw. I felt really distressed about because I had had such a difficult journey and yet I was supported by a great lawyer pro bono by the enormous support of my colleagues in BBC Women um, and by my union and I thought what must it feel like to go through this on your own so I was concerned about that which is why I gave the money to do that but also um, to fight strategic litigation